Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back. And today we're going to be talking about the disaster cycle. This is going to be a little bit longer than I normally do, and it's a whole different format. There's going to be a lot of jump cuts. I'm not used to doing that, so y'all be be there with me. Uh, but we're going to propose an alternative timeline theory. I'm going to try and keep it in line, for the most part, with where the science currently understands us to be. I'm not going to get too wild with it. Uh, there are alternative timelines that involve Atlantis, for example, and involve Lemuria, for example. And we're not really going to dive into that today. There is definitely some wiggle room in what I am doing that will allow for those civilizations. But what we're going to do is try and base this off of the current understanding of science. Um, with that being said, we're going to dive into the presentation. This is the alternative timeline theory. And uh, this is me compiling things. You will see references in here to some of the things from Randall Carlson's pod podcast, some of the things that Graham Hancock talks about, some of the things from the Thunderbolts Project, and some of the things from Ben Davidson over at Suspicious Observers. All of those are linked on my page in my favorite channels. So if you are looking for more information on the things that I'm talking about here, they are actual scientists who actually do the actual science. I'm just looking at the patterns and trying to discern from the patterns something that we can use. I believe that we are in a cyclical pattern. Um, that this cyclical pattern is periodic and recurring. <clears throat> it appears to occur on the grand scale once every 12,000 years. But there are halfway points at about 6,000 years that are trackable as well. I didn't do a lot of tracking for the 6,000 year. I stuck mainly to the 12,000 year with the exam, with the, well, one exception being the current epoch that we are in. <clears throat> these events, these uh, disasters, this cycle is uh, typified by a mass extinction event, a significant climatic change, and a possible shifting of the actual location of the Earth in relation to its axis. So instead of being North Pole, South Pole at the top and the bottom, the where that is now, it might shift 90 degrees. We've talked about that before, and we will talk about that more as we go through this. Uh, but after this event, there appears to be a great recovery period and an explosion. There's a population event, and humanity tends to go into a new direction after this. We get more knowledge, we get more um, base for who we are and what we are doing in life. Right? Uh, I believe that these periods just happen to overlay with the, or the, the chakras. I spend a lot of time on the chakras because magnetics are real. And the octave is real. And we are about to enter a new part of the octave. And it is a repeating part. It is the end of one cycle, the beginning of another cycle. And it is taking us into the divine and back into the base. And so let's go through this. Uh, there are smaller half cycles of 6,000 years. There are is possible repetition of the Dansgaard Oeschinger events, which is a rapid warming followed by a slow cooling due to uh, there are what's called Heinrich events, which is whenever uh, icebergs break free from the polar caps and start floating around. Uh, they appear to be possibly on a repetition of 400, 1,470 years, give or take. All the dates and numbers in here are by necessity, guesses. They are the best common guess that we have as a civilization for the events in question. Uh, we cannot know with absolute certainty, for example, on the next slide, this was 72,000 years ago. We cannot date that much closer than that. We cannot get much closer than, well, it was about 70,000 years ago. The math appears to be on a 12,000 year cycle. So we are going to go with 72,000 years. 
this would have been the first age of man. This was the Toba event. Uh, there was a massive uh, volcano that happened at this time. There was a mass extinction event and a rapid divergence in humans. This is where it is commonly accepted that men began to diversify inside the species. That's where we are going to start as a species looking at us. There were <clears throat> commonly accepted humans before this and we don't have a whole lot of evidence of development prior to this so we're going to deal with what we can actually talk about with actual evidence for now. We will probably get into some of the other uh, theories about evolution and history farther along in in the, the exploration that we're doing. But this is when the Disapora begins. This is when humanity begins to diversify and go other places. I relate this with the, the, the Eden event, the expulsion from Eden. When I first started laying this out, I was like, well, maybe the biblical timeline is off, right? It's obviously off, but we don't know how much it's off by. But I, I have a feeling that there was, at this point, an ark situation. And that uh, I don't have any hard scientific proof to prove any of that, of course. But it feels like this was the beginning of humanity, and so that's how we're going to treat it. Um, there was possibly a 10-year winter at this point in time where no warming whatsoever. And a thousand-year cold, that is debated. It is not necessarily set in stone, right? Most science should not be set in stone. But what happened was that there was definitely a massive ice sheet and there was definitely a, a major uh, defrosting, so to speak. I believe that is due to magnetics. I believe that the entirety of existence is a harmonic. It is a vibration. It is like the spoken word. It is like a torus that comes out of your mouth. You have do, the base of the music scale. You have do nut, the torus. You have do or t set, a forest of toruses, or the fundamental first principle geometries of magnetohydrodynamics. And you have Theodordian roots, self-organizing scaffolding of spectra in local star systems. It all starts with donuts nested inside of themselves, or for the sake of science, we will call them toruses. The dynamic dilating torus even plays a fundamental role in our souls. You might have heard the saying, the eyes are the window to the soul. Now what is the shape of an eye? The torus. So the torus is technically the gate to our soul. In fact, every sound that comes out of our mouths is a torus. Even baby babble is exercising the torus because the larynx is a series of three sphincters which are themselves toroidal muscles. The lips are also a torus. The tongue can be thought of as the center of the torus arranging the sounds of the chorus of the toruses. Letters in the Hebrew alphabet are all derived from a rotating torus as the Muru Foundation shows. Birds, water spiders, fish, all use the vortex ring. So because existence is a vibration, we are going to um, assume that this was the beginning of our harmonic. This is where we began was the base event. This is where humanity started to become humanity. We're finding stone tools very basic stone tools, spear points, and a rock that you hit against another rock to make the rock chop. Right? But nothing too sophisticated. No big knives or swords or anything of that nature. This is just basic stone existence. You are just hunter-gathering. You are just migrating, not even really probably making you know, cities or... Uh, permanent settlements anywhere. There was no agriculture as far as we know at this point in time. So this was just a basic we are existing point in existence. And I believe that this overlays with the base part of the chakra which is just merely existing. 
Catastrophes in the time of man, the tempo of global change. What I've done here is I put a time bar that goes from the present right here. This is us now. This is today. Right here is May 3rd at 4 o'clock. Is it 4 o'clock? That's right here. And this is 150,000 years ago. And the reason I used 150,000 years is that some of the earliest skeletal remains ever discovered of modern humans date back to 150 to even to 180,000 years. Skeletons that appear to be indistinguishable from a modern skeleton. Which suggests that modern humans with presumably equivalent intelligence to our own were present on the planet at least this far back. So here we've got a 150,000 year time span. You'll notice this little red bar at the end. That red bar represents the span of recorded history which is basically the advent of Sumerian cuneiform writing. So if it turns out that there were modern humans living through this whole span of time, why is there no history? Well, now you've got to do is turn to these various things that I've put on here. These are events that have occurred. And I used a certain criteria for these events. And here's the criteria I used. I began studying the record of geological change, climate change, environmental change, and I focused on events that could be considered catastrophic. And catastrophic to the extent that were an event of an equivalent magnitude to occur now, it would basically in civilization as we know it. That's the criteria I use. What would, be, what would be the magnitude of an event that it would take to terminate our modern industrial civilization? That's the criteria that I used. Then I begin to search through the record of all of the events that would be of that magnitude or greater. And the events that I found so far have been entered onto this graph and they're listed all here. You can see them. And how many do we have here? And this is not complete necessarily, but we have at least 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 of them in 150,000 years. So at least 16 times in the last 150,000 years there have been climate or environmental or geological catastrophes powerful enough that were they to occur today would essentially put us back into the Stone Age. So I realize this part as I'm editing and <clears throat> what he's done here is actually double the octave and take it back a whole nother uh, generation into the past. So it's like a doubling of the octave that we're currently ending now. He's, it's got the ending in the middle of his timeline. And then it's got a whole nother version of the octave on the other side of it. It's great. Well then, 12,000 years from then would bring us to 60,000 years ago. And this brings us to a genetic bottleneck event. There is another uh, warming event. It, it happens just like the last time. There was a lot of cold and then there was a massive warming spike. And then a gradual cooling off on the back side of it. It is another Dansgaard Osinger event. There's also a Heinrich event associated with this, and that is the breaking free of the, the, the polar ice caps, having large chunks of it break free, and that causes cooling gradually through the oceans. But there's a genetic bottleneck event here. This was a massive die-off of humanity. We probably got down into the thousands of... Um, like the low thousands nobody knows exactly how far it got down but there was a massive something that happened around this time and it narrowed us down to what is considered genetic atom which is the one common ancestor so that would be a very tiny pool right um but we don't know definitively what right but this would be the second step this would be moving past just existing and getting a little bit more complicated tools. This would be where they are starting to make knife tools out of stone. So they're actually shaping the tools instead of just using the items that they find. 
this would be uh, the beginning of hunting uh, to a certain degree. This would be the beginning of um, understanding that there is more than just walking around gathering things. This is when we would see people starting to build buildings. Uh, maybe not permanent structures, but maybe something that they could carry with them so they didn't have to hide in the cave that they found that night. Or that they could travel to a new location and set it up. Like basic tools though. Nothing like they weren't having no no massive tents at the beginning of this. Probably by the end of it, at the end of the twelve thousand years, they were probably fairly well advanced. Twelve thousand years is a large chunk of time. We will get into that more at the end of the epoch, but each of these take place over twelve thousand years. There's a lot of room for improvement in twelve thousand years. And we will see as we go farther along that we start to build. It's a, it's like a snowball effect as we go along. Uh, for the first 12,000 years, we just kind of walked around and hunted. But at this point, humanity narrowed down into a very specific set of genetics. And when it narrowed down to this specific set of genetics, we came out on the other side with an accumulated understanding of certain things. That includes tool making. This is when we really got into starting to make tools. The third age is going to be aligned with the solar plexus, right? This is where we started really worrying about food. This is the third dimension. We're worrying about time. We're starting to worry about, like, like we have, we're not really in charge of time yet, but we're starting to understand that it is a thing, right? We can grow and we can move and we can walk about our area. And this is our great leap forward. This is where we start to understand, um, significance of things for other things this is where uh, the, the point of getting to a to representation in a spiritual manner this is where we believe that speech as we currently understand it developed past the point of grunting and uh, nonverbal communication which was probably prevalent prior to this there was seems to be significant data that there was a lot of development in the vocal cords that there was a lot of understanding that accumulated at this point in time. This was the Lachamp excursion and there was a megafaunal extension of the Neanderthals and the Australian Aborigines. Uh, Aboriginal uh, wildlife. They, they, they try to say that there was a like people people showed up and they just killed all the things. Well that doesn't track with you know hunting anywhere and except possibly once overpopulation begins like in England right they once you develop more people than the resources can allow, then you get to the point of overhunting. But when you just move in, you're not going to kill off all the megafauna. It's just not going to happen. Uh, they didn't have the numbers for it. it. It's just not possible. It doesn't track. Uh, this is where humans start to reach Asia, Europe, and the Americas. <clears throat> Assuming, of course, that uh, life originated I believe that it is like our Eden event, as I understand it, was probably located just east of the the Middle East and right in the, the, the mountain range that, that separates India from what, Saudi Arabia, I believe. Uh, but right along that area, right, right we, we've gone before, I've shown the mountains, and I believe that it was an arc discharge that pushed the people out, right? And so there appears to be a repeating pattern of that happening too. There's a flood and there's a fire. There's a flood, there's fire. And so we appear to be in the fire part of that. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, this is also where we have a, a, our first evidence of magnetic excursion. It's not necessarily a full reversal. It's not necessarily, there is evidence that there are repeating patterns of the earth flipping 90 degrees that showed that just underneath the surface ice, there was 12,000 layer sediments of polar fossils, tropical fossils, polar fossils, tropical fossils, over and over again. The world goes like this, stays that way for 12,000 years, and then it goes back. Boom, boom, 12,000 years each time. This is by far the best evidence, that plus all of the other uh, evidence that exists of the actual crustal displacement is impossible to refute. Um, and there's no way to get that evidence unless the Earth does this back and forth. We've got another paper here on the Parker instability and magnetic flux tubes within the galactic sheet.
These are two features you only see in such wavy, rippling current sheets, always surrounding a spinning magnet like a star or galactic nucleus. The flux tubes at the galactic level are not unlike those in the similar sun's current sheet as we look at the endless spiral, which string outward through that sheet and help drive particle flux at up to relativistic speeds. And the Parker instability they mention, by the way, takes a flat disk and quickly turns it into this, a wavy, rippling current sheet. That appears to be the pattern. That appears to be where we're going. But I didn't really get the evidence for that in this presentation. That will be another presentation. But this is where we first start seeing the magnetic excursions. And there is a line of thought that believes that the magnetic excursions probably have a lot to do with our development. I believe that there were magnetic excursions, even if we don't have the evidence for them, in the prior two epochs. At the same point in time, the 12,000 year mark, and that's like, could be 11,900, it could be 11,000. There's, there's a range there, but around the 12,000 year mark, we get this ex magnetic excursion, and it causes a great leap forward. It causes us to move in a new direction, to start with a greater understanding of the knowledge we already have, and to expand upon that. This is the first example that we have of evidence of that magnetic excursion happening. And it's right when speech develops. It's right when the first jewelry starts happening, where standard tools become a thing. Like we, had, we started making the basic tools. Well, now they're more standardized. Now you have actual craftsmen crafting tools. You have actual jewelry makers crafting jewelry. Now, this is simple jewelry. This is not quite yet... Uh, pouring and casting of metals. This is simple jewelry. Uh, and the Disipora appears to be like people are starting to reach the farthest reaches of the earth. I believe that's possibly because of one of these events caused people to move out, right? I think that's what happens repeatedly. The fourth age is going to bring us into what would align with the heart. This is where we start to grow and understand time. Not only just understand the concept of, okay, tomorrow is a thing, but the concept of, hey, maybe we can start to plan to survive forward in time. This was about 36,000 years ago, and this was a great artistic leap. This is where we started really following our hearts. This is where we really started um, creating sophisticated artworks. The Grotto de Bran, um those are some really sophisticated paintings for people who were only working with stone tools. They, there's, what I believe happened was that there was a civilization at the end of each one of these epochs that gets destroyed. And some of them, those people that get destroyed are farmers. And they're hunters and gatherers and sometimes they're artists. And I think that this particular instance, it was one of the artists that, that made it through that did this particular artwork um, and that the reset of civilization is not always necessarily back to ground zero we do retain some of the knowledge but it varies depending on who gets hit there was a megafaunal extinction in North America this is again blamed on aboriginal peoples uh, that somehow the Native Americans who didn't do it whenever they had control of the entire continent with the buffalo or the bison, uh, just just hunted everything until it died, and that just doesn't make sense. Again, we have another magnetic reversal evidence here, and again another leap forward. This is the great artistic leap forward. Uh, it seems like every time we get one of these magnetic excursions, that that should say excursion, not necessarily reversal. Uh, I believe that the science lines up with a full reversal and the magnetic shift of 90 degrees, but the current science doesn't, the current understanding of science doesn't really support that, so I wasn't trying to get too much into that with this one, but I do believe that the shift happens and I do believe that it is recurring on these cycles. There's also a, a midpoint that causes other issues, and we'll get to that in just a second. The fifth age, this is going to be the throat. This is where we start communicating things, and this is our religious leap forward. This is where we start planning for the divine part, right? We've, we've dealt with time, and now we're dealing with, oh, my God, I'm going to die one day. And when you figure out that, hey, I'm going to die one day, you start looking at the leap forward. There was uh, 
the Lake Mo Mongo excursion, the megafaunal extinction was in Australia and Eurasia. Um, but this is where we got our first star maps, and this is where shamans come in. This is where we start having healing people. There was a Nova event from the, the Vela system, and uh, this appears to align with the magnetic excursion timing and the religious leap forward. So there was a sign in the sky that made people start to appreciate religion and that they might die. I think that this was when we really started paying attention to this cycle. This is where we picked up weaving and sophisticated crafting in that manner. And so uh, we built upon the artistic from before to more practical dealing with time. And once you can weave, you can make storage. And so once we got into the storage 24,000 years ago, for you cultural appropriation people, everywhere is on the planet started weaving at the same time. Like with very little variability. And so this was something that happened outside of just one pocket and then slowly spreading. It happened here and it happened way over here too. At the, roughly the same time with not enough time to pass. So this is another evidence that the magnetic excursion proceeds a great leap forward. This is again a cold period interrupted by a brief period of rapid warming followed by a long period of cooling. Oh. And that's going to bring us into the Sixth Age. This is 12,000 years ago. This is the third, the third eye region. This is looking forward. This is seeing into the future. Oh, this is where we have legends of ancient past. This is where we, as humanity, seem to remember something from the past being better. I mentioned before that I believe that there were civilizations at the end of each one of these epochs. They may not have been flying around in whatever powered cars or you know jets or whatever like there's some serious conspiracies out there about that and while I don't necessarily discredit all of them I don't believe all of them uh, there are cultural memories that remember something there when we analyze Plato's description of Atlantis Plato basically gave the sink the date of the sinking of Atlantis as 9,000 years prior to Solon, the, the Egyptian, the, the, the Athenian poet and statesman, Solon, did a 10 year exile in Egypt. And it was Solon that brought back the tale of Atlantis and presented it to the, to the Greeks. And Solon basically made that journey around 600 BC. So if you add the 9,000 years to the 600 BC, we come up with a date of about 11,600 years ago for Plato's date for the, 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 the demise of Atlantis. Well, it's very interesting that the date 11,600 years has been independently discovered by geologists looking at the tempo of various catastrophes that have occurred on Earth. And this is the period of time when the Sahara was lush and we really got a grip on agriculture. We really started learning how to grow things. This was the Younger Dryas event. This was a massive period of rapid warming, rapid flooding, and a megafaunal extinction. I'm going to go ahead and insert the video here so that you can see a representation of what this appears to have looked like. This is a representation made for a TV show, the credit is included, that shows um, how our geography was changed by this flooding. This is pretty close to how it happened, but the water was probably a little bit deeper. Uh, this is a very light amount of water for this, this particular section. And so, um, the Sahara was lush, there was much more moisture around, there was probably, the Fertile Crescent was a lot more fertile, there was, was probably a lot more growth in the area of Egypt. This is where, um, this is where I believe that the current understanding is off. I think that this is the beginning of the actual Eden story. It's not 
6,000 years ago. It's not 4,500 years ago or, or 4,500 B.C. This was 12,000 years ago. I believe this was the expulsion from Eden. I believe that this is where we actually literally saw the, the fire fall from heaven and block them out of the lush lands that they once lived in and put them into a new place. Uh, and so uh, that's going to bring us into the present age, right? This is going to bring us into where we are. I believe that the 12,000 years was the Eden event and from there forward is where we're at. But we only have records inside, like literal records. We have fossil records and we have um, cores and samples and things that we can take from the environment in the past but the actual recorded we know what this means records all come from this period in time from 12,000 years ago to now and more than that within the last 6,000 years within the last half cycle is all of our civilization every written record that we have comes from here this is where we start to see mechanical growth and the understanding of mechanics. This is where we start to see boats. This is where we start to see um, mechanical agriculture and domestication of, of crops and animals. This is where we see the modernity, where we get all of our advancements as humans, as humanity, comes within the last 6,000 years. Within the last 6,000 years, we learn metalworking and how to get to space. And so, we're going to dig just a little bit more into this. Oh, this is coming from the half point event, right? And so, at the at the 12,000 years, we get one event. And it appears that at the 6,000 years, we get another event. I think that these are alternating cycles. And I will play a video that uh, talks a little bit more about this from Randall Carlson here. 26,000 years before present. Remember the great year and the processional cycle? Add about 80 years to that, and we've got 26,000. Of course, 26,000, you consider a figure plus or minus a few centuries. Now, you come through that cosmic clock that I showed you, right? Halfway to the cusp of the age of Leo. 12,900 years ago, roughly. And what happened? We have something that happened. 12,900 years before present, Onset of the Younger Dryas Climate Catastrophe, first phase of the megafaunal extinctions. Mm hmm. Let's, now here what I've done is I've entered some green dots. Now look at the, what the green dots are. The green dots are basically derived directly from the model of the great year, based upon cycles of 6,480, 12,960 and then 25,920. And you'll notice how high of a correlation there is between the tempo of events, the actual events that have been derived by scientists without any reference to this great year model at all, and the timing of these ages of the world. Remember the 6,480 years that was the uh, the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the man. And according to the traditions, each of those seasons of the great year is inaugurated by some type of a great event, a transformative event, a catastrophe, if you will. And what I've done here is I have developed a data set that shows the correlation. It certainly seems from a study of this graph that these intervals, these event nodes as I call them, the susceptibility of something happening goes up exponentially for a short period of time. We covered this story Sunday, March 19th in the morning show and a number of emails have come in asking about it. A lot of the focus on the story was how the South Atlantic anomaly is not a permanent feature but a symptom of the ongoing secular variation. But the questions were about the timeline of the study the NOAA event I referenced, and the quiet period of the study, specifically asking about the evidence for geomagnetic variation during that NOAA event 6,000 years ago in the period just before the quiet period in the study. Little sneak peeks from our upcoming book. The event 6,000 years ago 
isn't on the geomagnetic variation list or the Heinrich event list, but it should be. This is a compilation of paleo intensity measurements showing the strength of the field. And the first thing that should jump out is the variability to the curves and to the dating process in general. If this chart extended back a few thousand years more to 12,000 years ago, off to the right, we would see a drop down at the Gothenburg geomagnetic event. And on the left, we see the descent into the modern geomagnetic event. The half cycle at 6,000 years ago is a lesser event, but it's clearly showing up in the records as a dip, even if the dating methods don't agree, never have, and never will. The range covers a broader minimum centered around 6,000 years ago. This matches the volcanic evidence from that period, and also the tropical hydroclimate event, the greenest of the green Saharan episodes, the interglacial version of a Heinrich or Dansgaard Oeschger event, and with the solar forcing to match the cycle in what is now officially called the solar Heinrich Bond cycle. The quiet period studied in this paper is the one that immediately followed the NOAA event, and the fact that the quiet began right after the expected NOAA event speaks further to the lack of quiet during the NOAA event. Remember, they recognize these events at every 6,000 years into the past, but not the one 6,000 years ago. It doesn't look like the previous ones, which happened during glacial conditions, but we can still pick it out when we look at geomagnetism, volcanoes, and global paleoclimate data. This is the NOAA event, the half cycle event 6,000 years ago, and the full cycle setting a new age is what we are awaiting now. Our understanding of life going forward from this point is going to be from that point forward. Uh, there appears to have been records, like mental records, if not physical records, of this. But we also seem to have records that are hidden from us, as you saw in that video, that talks about a cycle. This cycle, I believe, either falls at 6,000 years or at 3,000 years. There's a possibility that we get a, a quarter point cycle as well and maybe even an eighth point i don't know but there is significant evidence for a 12,000 and a 6,000 year cycle the 12,000 year cycle appears to be fire and the 6,000 year cycle appears to be floods and it seems like maybe 6,000 years ago we got the flood the priests gone after invoking the the myth of fate and and, and the consequences of of that kind of a an event they go on to say that when this happens, those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destructions than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. And from this calamity, the Nile, who is our never failing savior, saves and delivers us. When on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with the deluge of water, among you herdsmen and shepherds on the mountains are the survivors, whereas those of you who live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea. The fact is that wherever the extremity of winter frost or of summer sun does not prevent, the human race is always increasing at times and at other times diminishing in numbers. And what if, whatever happened, either in your country or in ours or in any other region of which we are informed, if any action which is noble or great or in any other way remarkable has taken place, all that has been written down of old and is preserved in our temples, whereas you and other nations are just being provided with letters and other things, but then at the usual period, the stream from heaven descends like a pestilence and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education, and thus you have to begin all over again as children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times, either among us or among yourselves. I believe that Adam was 12,000 years ago and that Noah was 6,000 years ago, and everything from Noah to now falls in between there. And so for the first age of Adam, right, we're going to take this to 6,000 years with Noah. We're just going to start right here, but understand that I labeled this Adam even though I think that there was a whole nother 6,000 year cycle in between Adam and Noah. We're going to start at 6,000 years here. And so we're going to label this 
half part of the cycle. We're going to start with Adam just because it was convenient for me. And we're going to say that this was 6,000 to 5,000 BC. This was, the again, this is the base. This is survival only. This is hunting and gathering. This is not doing uh, sophisticated, like, sophisticated metalwork. This is when we begin to get metalworking, period. This is starting to melt copper. This is starting to melt silver and gold. But not really to make any alloys. Not really for any complicated forging. This is where almost all of our monument building is credited to. That is from uh, the pyramids, which I believe are significantly older than that, but we're not going to get into that right now. That goes for the snake mound. That goes for the pyramids in Romania. That goes for the pyramids in uh, Chichen Itza. That goes for all of the monuments everywhere, Stonehenge, everything, was attributed to this point in history. This would have been, according to my timeline, the time of Noah. Oh, I've got it listed as Adam. I know that's a little bit confusing, but this would be where the flood myths come from. Oh, and in this 1,000 period of years, like this is how, this is how it is understood according to the Bible now, right? A roughly 6,000 years BC was the time of Adam according to the Bible now. I believe that it's different, but that's how they, that's how it is written, and so that's what we're going with for this. Uh, this is when we learned irrigation, this is where we learned domestication, and this is where all of our flood myths reside. There is more than one flood myth, if you were unaware. All of them point to this time period. They All of them point to roughly 6,000 years B.C. And so that's the, the Hindi, that is the Israeli, that is the Babylonians, that is the Aztecs, that is the Hopi. Everybody's myth, flood myths, which everybody has one, all point to the same period of time. The second age is Enoch, right? This was between Adam and Noah, and this was roughly 5,000 to 4,000 BC. This represents the sacral and the chakra stack, which is your your trickster and your sexual energy. It deals with reproduction. This is where we really started dealing with gold. This is where we developed the calendar and figured out the Nile flood cycle. Oh. Uh, there was a great increase of knowledge in this point of time. The next stage is going to be Noah. This is commonly attributed to the flood. That's why it is here. But I believe it was 6,000 years ago, right? But this is when we have evidence of iron developing, cuneiform writing, the horse, and wine. This is dealing with the nourishment of the body. This is the solar plexus chakra. And so it is going to be dealing with Oh, what you need to do to be nourished as a people. And so we learned how to work iron. We learned how to write. We learned how to domesticate horses. We learned how to make wine. All of those things are necessary. If not for those things, humanity would not be the same. Any of them. The seventh age is kind of a lost age. This is Babel. This is between Noah and Abram. This is 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, but I believe that this actually falls prior to Enoch. Oh, but it's listed in the Bible as falling here, so we're going to put it here. This is 3000 to 2000 BC. This is the heart and fulfillment. Well, this is where we get our spiritual art, the map of the moon. We get the first physician on record, Imhotep. We get the paved road. We get trade with distant civilizations. We get bows and arrows in warfare and the first ever record of slaves. All of this takes place in the time of Babel. Oh. The next part is the time of Jacob and Moses. This is when the kingdoms begin to come about. Right? This is after we get the law, and then we need a way to regulate the people. There was a period of transition there, but between 2000 and 1000 BC, we got the, the kingdoms, the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Amorites, the Babylons, the Hittites, the Egyptians, and the Israelites all took place in the same span of time. They all took place mainly in a single land, right? They, they were the kingdom of Samaria. They were the kingdom of Assyria. They weren't really empires yet. They were mainly dealing with only their own peoples. Oh, this is when we got mathematics and chemistry. 
This was throat area. This is about communication and uh, learning new things. Well, we just looked at that slide. The next stage was the days of the judges and the prophets. This was after the kingdoms. And this was the beginning of the empires. The, a few examples of the empires was the Neo-Assyrian, the Chaldean, the Medo-Persian, the Greeks, and the Romans. There are more kingdoms and there are more empires that fall into these time periods. But I didn't want to list all of them. If you're really interested, you can look it up. And they do all fall within a range of 1000 to 0 BC. And after 0 BC, they start to fall apart into a whole nother section. But this is going to be the third eye. This is going to be seen forward. This is empires. This is when we got the Iliad and the Odyssey, the first two great works of fiction. This was talking about the golden ages of yore. Uh, and so uh, that's going to represent the third eye in scene four. We just looked at that. And then we get into the age of intermediaries. This is zero to 1,000. This is going from empires into religious states. Uh, we went from uh, the empires that we just had into these religious states. The Holy Roman Empire, which was technically an empire, but it was a religious state, and this does not include the, the Roman Catholic Church as a whole, but instead the actual empire. This was the Islamic Caliphate was in, in here, the Japanese Shogunate, the Russian Orthodoxy, the Church of England, the Aztecs, the Ottomans. That's all just to show you that there was all of a sudden a need for an intermediary. There was a need for a religious state to take over in the fall of the empire or after the fall of the empires. This is where um, we got biology, algebra, astronomy, navigation, and surgery. So all of our major sciences came in this particular age between 0 and 1000 AD. Uh, this was the time of Christ. This was the beginning of the churches. And then we get into the age of direct revelation. This gets us into the divine chakra, which is dealing with personal revelation. Well, this is from 1000 to 2000. This is the, the failure of the religious states. This was when we got the Reformation, the Protestantism as a, as a, as a cause. This is where we picked up all of our great scale advancements. We got communications across wirelessness. We got universities. We got space travel. We got a lot of plagues. We got a lot of uh, war. Like our large scale warfare takes place here. This is where all of our advancements as we know them now take place. And all right, so before we talk about what's in the next cycle, which we're about to begin because we're going into the eighth part of the octave, which is the beginning of the next octave. So before we get into that, let's talk about what the cycle is and where it happens. So we're going to go from here and we're going to look at this. This is the basic cycle of the earth. You should be familiar with this. This should not be new. Uh, this is the sun. There's a couple of planets in between and there's the earth. The earth goes around the sun. Beyond the sun, or beyond the earth, there's other planets, and there's an asteroid belt and all of that. But <clears throat> I believe that this is held in place by magnetics. There is something inside the earth that is pulled towards something inside the sun. At the same time, there's something holding it away. So it's got an equilibrium in a certain spot. Uh, we're going to show an overlap here. This is what we look like on the next scale up. We've still got our sun, we've still got our earth, but now we have a center of our galaxy. We are rotating around the sun, but the sun is rotating around this galaxy. I believe that at some point in this galaxy, on an about a, on about, <clears throat> on about a 12,000 year cycle, there is a point that we touch as a planet that does something to us. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a comet or a planet or something of that nature coming in on a long orbit from elsewhere to our sun. It can be us 
moving towards something that happens to orbit close to us. And so I think that at this point in space that we are about to pass through, we're going to be at this impact point. I believe that this impact point is represented at the top and the bottom. I didn't put it on the chart, but I believe that there is a greater cycle of 12,000 years and there's a lesser cycle of 6,000 years. And if you look at this like it's magnetics, then we're rolling around the, the sun in a groove. The sun puts off a torus of energy and we're, we're nested in that torus. We're sitting in that groove, the Mandelbrot groove. And it's where we reside as a planet. And we're going around in a circle in that groove of the Mandelbrot dot. And so what happens is at one point on this, we, this impact point is a positive ionic charge. And the opposite point is a negative ionic charge. And we get grounded or we pick up a charge. We either catch a heat cycle or we catch a wet cycle. We've seen that video, but so there's a, a cycle of heat and there's a cycle of wet. And I believe that is the positive and negative charge in this cycle around the galactic center. It doesn't necessarily have to be an extrasolar event that causes the grounding. We can move into that point in space. But how is matter birthed out of the sun from ionized gases? What is the self-organizing principle for this? Mainstream science will have you believe that matter cannot be created nor destroyed, but indeed, matter is created and self-organizes in specific pathways. In fact, the Doherty set proofs that matter organizes according to a scalable metric of a process called Markland convection. Energy literally comes from the sun and self-organizes in these collimated sheaths and it is all being held up by nested donuts. A wheel within a wheel, with rims and spokes high and low, inside and out. At that time, I had completed the derivation and interpretation of a mathematical model that had been started by Stieg Lindqvist in 1950. He had determined two equations that described the basic shape of the magnetic field that is inside a Birkeland current, but that's where he stopped. I completed his model to include five major equations and also interpreted what they implied about the physical shape of the Birkeland currents and their behavior, uh, and that was not explained fully by Lindquist. My model predicted that Birkeland currents uniquely produce coaxial counter-rotational motion of their internal plasma and are able to carry electric current in both directions at the same time. Let me emphasize, this is a unique behavior. A coaxial cable here on Earth cannot simultaneously carry current in both directions. As far as we know, true coaxial counter-rotation is created in nature only by field-aligned, that is to say, Birkeland currents. How are Birkeland currents formed? Concentric circles, nesting, is what gives off the initial Bessel function from the sun. And this Bessel function repeating is what builds up the recursions or recursive nature of fractal patterns that we observe in reality. The recursions of these dilating nested toruses is what builds up the subsequent size and ratios of the double-layered sheaths that make up the body of Birkeland currents. So the collimated structure of Birkeland currents is literally composed by counter-rotating toruses. What's more is that this is how you get the helicity and double helical filaments that are observed everywhere in stellar formations. The helical filaments are a byproduct of the dilating toroidal nodes progressively expanding via projective geometry. Well, you see, our planet is on a cosmic highway around the galaxy. And we're now beginning to understand the fine structure of the galaxy and we realize that there is a pattern and an order to it. And there's a tempo of these orbital revolutions. There's a tempo of the galaxy. And there's a wave pattern of the Earth moving up and down, above and below the galactic plane. And within that there are suborbital cycles as well. And we also discover that 
there seems to be a tempo in the delivery of cosmic matter to the inner solar system. It doesn't seem to be random. And this is going to be beyond the scope of today's lecture, but what I'm getting at here is that the evidence now supports the conclusion that the delivery of cosmic material and energy, the energy pulses that would be affecting Earth are non-random that they are on some kind of a cosmic timetable, a cosmic tempo, if you will. And I think this is one of the most important insights we get from these ancient traditions, is the measurement of cosmic time and how it relates to us here on Earth. You just got to know what to look for and where to look for it. Once you begin to become aware of it and you begin to see it, you begin to realize that the cosmic fingerprints are everywhere about us. We're in fact living in and upon the wreckage of the former worlds. The rubble of these former worlds is all around us, but we haven't had the scale of perspective to see it. And that's where we're at now. I, I'm completely thrilled with things like the emergence of Google Earth because Google Earth is now allowing us to just somebody, all of us, to sit at our computers and see the cosmic perspective of Earth. And when you look at it from you know, from the, from the extraterrestrial point of view, things begin to show up that we don't see when we're right down here immersed on it so close that we're like ants walking under rubble and can't, can't see what, what's around us. But we do see that we literally have built our own world and our own social system on top of and out of the wreckage of former worlds. But that seems to be what, what's going on. Like and we're about to hit this point in the cycle. I wanted to show this before we get to the next point in the cycle where we talk about what to expect. There is something coming. It is not based off of cow farts, but there is something coming that we do need to be aware of, not necessarily scared of, but aware of. It is a serious concern. And so we need to raise awareness of this serious concern so that we can, as a species, be prepared so that we can, as a species, do what we need to do. And we'll get to that in the next part. All right, so hopefully I've laid out the groundwork for that there is a cycle, that there is something coming, and here's what I believe is coming and what we can do to prepare for it. Because there are things that we can do to prepare. Uh, I believe that there is a warm end event, what I call a warm end event, uh, which means that we are looking more for uh, the, the lightning and plasma discharges than for the flood situation. If it was a wet end event, it would be a flood situation. Uh, I think that there is significant evidence for it being a warm end. When it says that it, they'll hide in their caves and it will be of no use to them, I think that's because there's going to be the caves in the mountains are going to be discharged. If you look at the Hopi lands, uh, I'll try and pull up a graphic to put up here, that if you look at the Hopi lands where they're situated as opposed to the mountains and the wet areas, they're perfectly situated to weather both sides of the calamities. They're not really going to be affected by the floods as much as some of the other places might be. And they're not going to be affected by the, the plasma discharges. They're far enough away from the mountain ranges to be protected from that. Uh, it says to not be in the high places whenever this part of the cycle comes that I believe we're in. But I could be wrong. We could be on the flood end of things. And if we were on the flood end of things, down where I'm at in the lowlands is going to be a really bad spot to be. Not everybody is going to make it. Uh, and that's just a fact. And no matter where you go, you could be choosing the wrong spot. There's no need to panic about where you are located. Uh, I believe that being closer to the mountains might be a bad idea, but I could be wrong. I am looking for extreme lightning events. When I'm talking about lightning events, I'm talking about discharges miles wide. This is not a bolt of lightning, but a bolt of lightning miles wide. A single bolt that wide. That much electrical discharge hitting these ground points in the mountains. So it's going to cause a lot of heat, a lot of distortion, a lot of problems. That's what I think is going to happen. 
<clears throat> I don't have time to get into as much of the detail on that as I would like. If you'd like to see more of that, let me know in the comments and we'll try and put something together like this for that. But uh, I, prior to the event, we're going to see heat rising sharply for an exterior peri extended period. Uh, right now, we're getting some extreme fluctuations, but we are really trending more on the cooler side. I think that is going to change, but it is not related to any farting cows. I think it's going to be the, the precursor to what is coming. We have time before that happens. Uh, and until that happens, there's not even really uh, an indicator that something's about to happen. Uh, we will see much more free water for a while precipitable water though this is going to be in the air because there's less compression in our atmosphere so there is more ability for uh, free water molecules to be floating around and therefore there's more room for them to be in clouds and precipitating and uh, so we're going to get more torrential rains when we get rains and uh, drought will be more significant. Uh, that will be leading up to this event. Uh, there will be drastic climate change. But again, this is not related to anything you can be taxed for. This is outside of that realm. All we can do is adapt to this. We, as our, our communities, need to come together in a way that we can survive on the other side of this. Um, where we are is going to depend on what the response is. Is it warm or if is it wet? If it is warm, which I think, then being in the higher areas is not that great of an idea. When you have the jagged, rugged landscapes, is probably grounding points. Uh, so it's probably not a great idea to be there. But on the same token, if it's wet, then it being in the lowland areas around rivers is probably not a good idea you'll get swept out to sea that's what we saw in the video right that is from a record <clears throat> that the churches have hidden right that we don't get to see but they're there and there are references to them all over the place and not just that one specific one but many other ones and so i do speculate that they we will see the warm end of things I think that the point that we're at now is where we were at the end of the Younger Dryas. Whenever there was the severe glacial melt, but we don't have the, the glaciers. And so, while there will be glacier melting, it will not be nearly as significant as it was in that manner for the Younger Dryas. But we will see significant earth changes because of the, the discharge and the, the overcharging of the mantle is going to cause disruptive events on the on the surface. We'll see volcanic activity, earthquake activity, and crustal shifting of areas, much like we had in Atlantis. Uh, and that was at the the proposed end of the Younger Dryas was that at Atlantis there, and so we're looking at a warm end event. That's what I speculate. And what we get depends greatly on where you should be. Um, why do I think of lightnings? Is because of the, the legends. The, all, all the legends of the gods hurling lightnings. I believe that Eden was a plasma event. That I did that in my Genesis series. But I believe that when Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden. And there was a great fiery sword of an angel that drove them away. And wouldn't let them come back. I think that's what that was. I think the mountain range right there was created at that point. There was a plasmark discharge and they were at the edge of it and they got driven away. But something in that changed them a little bit to where they were conscious of things in a way that they weren't before. And so uh, we have evidence that there are significant leaps following these like uh, significant events there are significant events all throughout and so uh, 
human history seems to we, we bottleneck and things get really tough but we come out of the other side better off in the longer run sometimes or just completely wiped out to the stone age and I think we might be at the point in the cycle where we will be completely wiped out to the stone age so what can we do right uh, this is if it's warm then what before the event we're going to be seeing five to ten years of heat with a five to t 15 degree shift year over year uh, really fast like that will be significant heat increases like potentially exponentially as we draw closer to this point in space if this hypothesis is correct at all which it may not even be if we are approaching the point in space that is going to ionize us and we're going to pick up the charge instead of grounding it out if we're approaching this point in space as we get closer to it we get more resistance and we will pick up heat until we get to the point where we pick up the charge from the the actual plasma discharge to the planet so as we're approaching we will get significantly hotter up to the point of the event uh, because of this there will be more water in the air and the wet places will be wetter and the dry places will be drier because more water will mean that it will follow the same natural patterns that it has to accumulate in places where the terrain drives it to accumulate and where the magnetics of the planet attract it to and until those move they're not going to change that pattern so we will get terrible monsoons in places that flood and we will get horrible droughts in places that are drought prone uh, the naturally dry places will want to return to dryness like the wet places are going to flood but like in the deserts it's going to get really dry because the magnetics are going to be intensified and like magnetics drive precipitation just like it drives the way that we move the way that the earth is structured the bulge in the middle everything is driven by magnetics and that includes where the rain falls to a large degree and so until the magnetics change they're just going to intensify in their spots and then because we are going to be getting more energy the closer we get to this point regardless like no matter what we do there is nothing we can do to stop that all we can do is prepare for that and this may not start for a while like this may be many years into the future <clears throat> after the event there will be severe climatic disruptions we will go from north pole south pole like this as a crustal flip we will move 90 degrees we will be located differently in space around the sun so what your seasons are now you will not be the same if this happens at all like there is a slim chance that you'll be fairly close if you're in a place that doesn't move much right and that's relative to the rest of the globe but for most people in most places it's going to be significant and getting yourself oriented to the place that you need to go it needs to be a high priority oh we will have a loss of our seasonal senses because right now we're coming into winter and if this happened tomorrow and we moved to the southern hemisphere it, we would be coming into summer and so everything will be thrown out of whack for that right on top of any flooding on top of any discharge being located in a different place is a stressor to all of the wildlife. It is a stressor to all of the the flora and the fauna. Because if you're an oak tree and you're going into dormancy now, and then all of a sudden you spring out and it's summertime, well, that's a whole cycle that's getting thrown out of whack. You don't miss spring, so you're not blooming, and you're you're into summer, so you should be thir thirst thoroughly nourished and growing and now you're dying you're getting ready to go into dormancy in the fall so that that's a whole different level of problems right 
all of this is going to be real. That is a loss of seasonal senses. You're not going to be knowing when to plan and when to do things. So getting an understanding of how to do that is very important too. Electric, electricity generation and distribution systems will fry. Like 99% chance they are not going to be able to move them generators ever. Like I'm talking about the wound generators, the things they use to spin the generators. <clears throat> or to, when it spins, it creates the electrical current that they use to generate things, right? That is how we get magnetics turned into electricity. Uh, that copper is going to just fuse. It's going to be a solid lump of copper. And we're not going to be able to replace that. It's not going to be readily available. It's not going to be something we are going to be prioritizing for a long time. We will not be changing transformers for a long time. There's a very good chance that the the wiring above our heads is going to just melt. That's a good chance of that. And so electrical generation and distribution is going to be gone. You will not be able to rely upon that. There is a slight possibility that if you take appropriate precautions, you might be able to keep some of your things from being just fried. Uh, ben Davidson had a very good suggestion of putting it in a heavy rubber box because that is an insulator. But that's limited to what you can put into the box and what you can charge that you can also put into the box, right? So electrical generation is going to be not something you're going to be prioritizing. In, unless you are going to try to be techni technological wizard guy, right? But for, for most people, this is not going to be a high priority. And it's going to take a very long time if a lot of people, like if most people survive and most cities are only severely damaged, which I do not believe is going to be a possibility. I, I believe it's going to be significant damage regardless of where you're at. And most people will not make it. They just will not. <clears throat> oh. If you do make it, you know, like, your priorities are going to be finding food, getting set up to grow some food, and protecting yourself from people. <laughs> That's going to be your priority. So you need to be set up for that to begin with. How to prepare. You want to have hand tools and seeds. I think you're not wanting to have skill saws. It would be great, and you, maybe you can work it out where you can have that. But do not prioritize that. Prior prioritize a hand saw. A axe, a hatchet, a machete, knives of multiple uses. Um, anything steel that you want to have, keep it in a rubber box. Right? Have all of these tools in a rubber box with your seeds. Um, you want to have enough seeds to start enough to get you and your family through a year if the, everything goes right. So you want to have enough... Like, Make sure you're packing the right seeds. We'll get into that in other videos, but um, you definitely want to do that. You want to prioritize how to find your new cardinal directions and begin immediately your seasonal observations. Immediately find east. Immediately post east where you can mark and then you can figure out which way the progression is happening. You can get uh, north and south from that within a couple of days so uh, like you can get a seasonal sense of, of where it's moving north or south in a couple of days and you can figure out what you need to plant because some plants like it optimally if you pop up in springtime what you want to do is to start planting quick harvest foods and long harvest foods at the same time but if you pop up and it's almost fall then you know that you need to prioritize some quick harvest foods uh, so you need to get a, a sense of that as fast as you possibly can communal living is an optimal know your crew get to know the people that would be involved in that situation with you now hopefully they live close enough to get to you on foot or you to them on foot in a reasonable amount of time uh, probably within a couple of days 
would be enough time because when things start happening like Ben has a good video on that y'all should check it out uh, about the sun dimming and to a stellar dimming the main point here is that it wasn't circumstellar material blocking the light it was an actual change in the brightness of the star they say these intrinsic dimming events are far more common than astronomers originally believed which is also a nod to the potential for our sun to have a similar dimming when the ongoing galactic magnetic reversal hits its peak. The galactic current sheet is where that reversal occurs, and it's hitting our solar system now. We are moving from the north magnetic sector to the south as this wave passes, and this is vastly different than the galactic equator, which actually has no effect on magnetism without the current sheet sector separation. When we see that, that's time to do things. That is a sign in the sky that we've been looking for, right? And so then you worry until then you don't you make plans you do preparations so that if things do happen to go this way you're good do not go wild and crazy do not spend a butt ton of money but like if you're at the store and you happen to see a pound of raw corn that you can get heritage seeds from you might want to get that right or a pack of Heritage corn seeds, you go ahead and pick that up. Or heritage tomatoes seeds, pick that up. I say heritage because with heritage seeds, you can true breed them and get what you're trying to get. That's important. Uh, we'll do more videos on how to be prepared, but you do not need to be like, oh my God, we're all going to die. That's not what this is. But this is... This is what our climate crisis really is. This is what is really coming and that we really do need to prepare for. There are ways to maximize coming out of the other side of this if we're cooperative. Like if we get together as communities and we build resilient places that we can do this, we're good to go. And like it's unintentionally falling in line with the green agenda. Like there's a way to be carbon well, negative, I guess, in doing this and make it like sustaining, but it gets rid of a lot of the market though. So you'd be taking care of your neighbors more than you'd be going to Walmart. Some people would not be okay with that, but uh, if we had if we had pods of that in places, right? If there was a place in Louisiana and a place in Mississippi and a place in Tennessee and a place in Illinois or wherever and they were starting this in those places that would be great right we're gonna see how we can do about that anyway uh, that's all i got for this round hopefully i brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat complicated topic i relied a lot on other people to tell tell you the science because i'm not a scientist like i love science i, I watch it i pay attention to it but I'm not out there trying to experiment on shit. I like to see the patterns. I like to tell you about the patterns. Where possible, I will provide evidence. But these guys do it so much better. And you should definitely go and check out their pages. I have tried to give credit where credit was due on every clip that I have taken. Uh, but the algorithm does not like to put in links. So I'm not going to put in the links. Y'all have, have to put in the names yourselves. I'm giving the credit there so y'all can do that. Do that. Everything that I've shown you, there is so much more to dig into. All of these guys do such a great job of explaining things in a way that is easily understandable, but that is scientifically accurate, that has the science to support it. Go back and check them out. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Till next time, this has been Pit State. Peace.